Hello everyone, my name is Rachel Champagne. I'm the Marketing Specialist here at Enterprise DB. I'll be your host today for our webinar, New Approaches to Migrating from Oracle to Postgres in the Cloud. I'm joined by Mark Linster, Senior Vice President of Product Development here at Enterprise DB. Before we get started, I just wanted to go through a few housekeeping items. This presentation is being recorded. The lines are currently muted. If you have a question, please feel free to submit it in the question panel. Today's session is scheduled for one hour. We expect the presentation to last approximately 50 minutes and will allot any extra time for Q&A. If we do not have time to address all questions, we'll follow up afterwards with any attendee whose question was not answered. And now, without further ado, here is Mark Linster. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Uh, so welcome to the webinar. Uh, what we're going to try to do in the next uh, about 45 minutes is go through some of the key topics that you need to successfully migrate from Oracle to Postgres, especially Postgres in the cloud. I'll give you two demos and I'll make sure that everybody knows how at the end of this webinar they can do a sample migration, can get a um, uh, a $50 discount or even a $200 discount to the EDB Postgres cloud database um, and, uh, and, and successfully play with all the tools that I'm going to show you today. Okay, All of those are going to be available at the end of this webinar to you. So very first thing, what are the key takeaways? Well, what I want you to walk away with is an understanding what EDB Postgres cloud database service is and why it's a great platform to migrate to. I want to share with you why 50%, if not more, of all migrations are easy. The key is identify those that are easy, start with the easy ones first, knock off the other ones as you gain more experience. Why is it important to use an Oracle compatible version of Postgres and not just any Postgres? Um, and then what else do you need to make this work? And let's go through it step by step. How do I go about it? Okay, so really this is a, a webinar. I'll, I'll do some talking, but I'll spend a good bit of time um, demoing things. And all of these things that I'm going to demo to you are available to you. And you can use them at no cost after this webinar to get started. Okay, so, um, so quick overview of EDB promise I won't spend more than a couple of minutes on it, then I'll dive into the cloud database service, give you a demo for how to set that up so that immediately after this webinar, or maybe even during the webinar, you can just follow and do the same thing. Okay. Um, then um, we'll talk about why migrating, why, why we would migrate, um, you know, what are the, the building blocks for successful, successful projects, again, what are the things that you need to to migrate successfully, um, how to pick the migrations, and then yet another demo. Uh, actually, how to migrate an Oracle database. I'll show you the whole live migration, kit and caboodle, uh, schema, data, store procedures, everything. Okay, so EDB, quick introduction. We are the enterprise Postgres company. Um, think of us when you think about Postgres, the same way you think about Red Hat when you think about Linux. We're the enterprise company behind Postgres. Um, our version of Postgres, so uh, EDB Postgres Advanced Server, has been in the Gartner Magic Quadrant for six years. For six years, Gartner, Gartner has recognized that we have the ability to execute and the completeness of vision to allow enterprises to successfully leverage Postgres uh, for mission critical applications. Key thing in this magic quadrant is there is no other open source based relational database in here. Okay? Over time, all the other ones have disappeared and EDB Postgres is the only one standing. And that is because Gartner has recognized that we have the global reach, we have the capabilities, we have the completeness of vision that uh, enterprises of all sorts of all sizes and shapes need to successfully get mileage out of Postgres. And believe me, I mean, I'm biased, but uh, in my view, Postgres is the best open source relational database out there by far. Now, we're not just active um, in the commercial world with the Gartners and the Foresters, et cetera. Um, we're investing significantly into, uh, into open source. 
um, especially into Postgres, but also into PG Admin, PG Pool, and a whole host of other communities that are that are circling around Postgres. Starts with the core team, where have people like Bruce Momsen and Dave Page, um, who are helping direct the overall strategy for Postgres. We have named contributors and committers to the Postgres database, such as Andres Freund, Robert Haas, Amit Kapila, or Devrem Gundus. Uh, Devrem, many of you will know his work if you use a, a Postgres RPM uh, in the YUM repo. It's actually Devrem who is the key driver behind that. Uh, but then there's many others, um, such as Rushab or Tom or Mithun, that are named contributors to the overall project. And then other projects where uh, people like Akshay Joshi or Rishesh Vashi uh, contribute who are uh, named PG admin contributors, or uh, Mohammed Usama who is a named contributor to, uh, to PG pool. So we're working very successfully with large enterprises and large consultancies such as Gartner, but on the other side, the foundation for the work that we do happens in, in open source. So let me talk about the EDB Cloud Database Service. So what is the EDB uh, Cloud Database Service? Well, it is an on-demand service for EDB Postgres. You have it in the AWS Cloud in minutes, and I'll show you that in a couple of minutes, okay? It's flexible, so it has uh, pay-as-you-go pricing, so you can scale up, you can scale down. It is robust, it has built-in high availability, built-in point-in-time recovery, built-in encryption, all of that is there. But then what's really, really, really important is um, Oracle compatibility. That's one of the key differentiators for EDB Postgres. EDB Postgres Advanced Server has built-in native Oracle compatibility. Native compatibility with PLSQL, native compatibility with the major Oracle packages. It has um, Oracle compatible drivers for JDBC, ODBC, .NET, OCI, OCI compatible driver, a ProC compatible driver. So everything that you need to successfully migrate off Oracle onto Postgres is available in um, um, EDB Postgres Advanced Server, and that is an integral part of the EDB Postgres uh, database service. So. Um, what does it provide if we get a little closer? It has key automation tools that make provisioning very easy, scaling very easy, um, shutting down, restarting, copying, scale out, scale up. All of those things are supported with a click of a button. It integrates with a migration portal, which is the demo I'll give you. Um, it has built-in high availability. Um, it has built-in database templates which basically make it very easy for you to say, hey, I want to create a cluster that is immediately highly available and resilient, and I want to build that cluster for a certain purpose. So you could build a cluster for a departmental solution that needs read scaling. It's one click of a button, five minutes later, you will have that cluster with the right load balancer, with the right number of replicas, with the right uh, point in time recovery, et cetera. All of that will be there right away. And then obviously, you know, um, encryption, scale out, et cetera. All those things are immediately built in. So um, on top of that, because we've been in the Postgres business for a long time, in fact, we started in 2004, shipped our first version of EDB Postgres uh, in 2006, and because we work with many enterprise customers, we know how important it is to provide 24 by 7 service with a service level agreement, actual butts and seats, direct access to engineering, et cetera. Um, we're also providing human to human, real people support for EDB Postgres um, in, in the cloud. So that same capability is involved, uh, is, is included with your subscription in the cloud you get to work with our support organization. Um, if you sign up for DB Postgres in the cloud, do it right now. Go to cds.enterprisedb.com or go to our main website and uh, just click on Cloud Database Service. 
you get a fifty dollar uh, free uh, fifty dollar credit to get started. Use it in the first thirty days. We would love to work with you more closely. Contact us at CDS Help, and uh, we'll work with you to put you into, onto our premier beta um, uh, program, and that will give you two hundred dollars of free billing credits. So really, today there's no reason to not just get started with this. Now, let me show you how it works. Let me show you. Let me give you a. Um, a very close, uh, very close demo, or a very simple demo to show exactly, you know, how to go about it. So this is, um, you can see the um, um, the EDB website, and um, um, so what we would do is go to cloud here, um, and in there, go to the cloud database service. It's currently in beta, but within a very, very short time, it will go live. Um, you click on try it now for free and there you create your accounts and uh, I already have an account here created I'll go into this one here right now this one here is not yet set up so you can see that uh, we're asking you for uh, you know some payment information initially uh, to get you set up but if you're if you're Starting using this for the first time, your $50 credit will apply, so your credit card will not be charged in any way until you have completely consumed uh, that service. So let me, rather than putting in my credit card here, let me uh, let me log out again and go back into uh, uh, in with an account that already is set up with the right with the right payment information. So so after logging in here. Um, I will get to the, the cloud service console. In that cloud service console today, um, I can set up uh, uh, clusters, database clusters, right now in the US East and US West. But I, what's also very important is I can create differentiated team structures. So I can, I can have teams that uh, manage different clusters of databases. So I can have a QA team, I can have a development team, I can have a production team, I can also have a finance team that can only see the invoices, for example. So I can assign users to teams, like here my colleague Gabby Shoulders is part of the DevOps team and part of the production team. I am the administrator for this account. So there's a very differentiated setup here that allows you to manage large teams and manage the access that they have to different databases. So let me go back, uh, let me go back to the dashboard here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to U.S. East, um, and uh, in U.S. East, you'll see that I already have one cluster set up today. Um, so I have one instance running, um, and I'll show you how easy it is to, to just create a new cluster. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here and create a new cluster. I could launch that cluster from a template. I have a bunch of different templates here. For example, uh, I could say I want a um, production production advanced server um, set up that is read scalable at the enterprise level. Okay. When I do that, I can go in here and say, hey, give me the full details. What does this really mean? Well, I can see here um, I get the, the engine is EDB Postgres advanced server. Um, I get the, the storage is by default not encrypted. Um, I then generate um, uh, backups. Um, I have advanced scaling options. I have provisioned IOPS, et cetera. So all of that would be set up for you right away. So this would be a cluster consisting out of M5 four times extra large nodes with three replicas, okay? Um, and about uh, uh, 4,000 gigabytes of, uh, of storage all provisioned for you. So I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm actually going to do uh, a setup from, um, from a manual definition to show you more capabilities here. So I'm going to say, hey, this is my cluster called Demo2. And what I'm going to do is say, yeah, you know, this is a halfway, you know, halfway important cluster. So I'm going to say it's going to be an M5 large. And I'll say, well, I really need two, uh, two replicas, so three nodes in total. I'm going to start with 10 gigabyte of storage. Um, 
I want to have this EBS optimized so that I have provisioned IOPS. Um, and, um, you know, I'm going to, you know, obviously not use, uh, not use a, uh, a standard password in here, but I'm going to you know, replace it with something that is much, much more secure. Now it tells me here which availability zones would you like to use, and I'll just use the standard availability zones. Standard prop process is we distribute the members of the cluster across the availability zones uh, in a region. Um, then I can set my sitter map, so how can my cluster be accessed? Obviously, a sitter map of uh, 000 means um, it's available from anywhere. By default, I get the uh, the port of the um, um, of the load balancer. I can also set the ports for the direct members of the cluster. Um, and then my last step here would be, okay, what's my backup interval? And um, that's how I would set up. That's how I would set up my uh, my cluster in here. Okay. So I'm going to just set this all up. Go through this. Um, I'm going to say. Um, I'm only retaining one backup, but I could also say, hey, no, I need a whole week's worth of backups retained. Uh, I also need point-in-time recovery implemented. So now I'm just going to start launching this cluster, and now the, the, the cluster is going to be, be configured in the background uh, while, we are, while we're continuing the rest of our presentation here. So what you can see here, the system is now working on provisioning the virtual machine, the high availability, the database, and then it's going to configure uh, the software that's available. So while this is working, we can look at other options that are available here. So for example, I have an existing cluster, my demo one cluster, that I could now scale up. My demo one cluster is a relatively small cluster. So I could say, well, you know, I want more replicas. That would be very easy to do. Click of a button, and inside of five minutes, I would have more replicas. Um, I could create a special backup. If I want to start an expensive operation now or an operation that is risky, I could create a backup first so I could recover. I could create a clone. So if my development colleague wants to work on a copy of my database, I can just create a clone. I could upgrade the software on, that, on this system. I could also make the machine type bigger. So right now it's a T3, uh, I think it's a T3 micro, and I could just make it bigger and go to an R5 four times extra large capacity that I don't need right now, so I won't use it. Um, I can also just delete my cluster. So what you can see here is that my cluster operations, the operations needed to create a database, to work with that database, scale it up, scale it down, all that stuff is, is immediately immediately available and doesn't require a whole lot of understanding for Postgres, the command line, the tuning, etc. All of that is available for you in a, uh, in a graphical interface. Okay? So I'm going to let this, um, let this putter along and uh, we're going to go back a little bit to uh, the migration topic. And then once, uh, once this is fully configured, I'm come, I'll, I'll come back and uh, and we can continue the discussion about any other kind of um, clustering capabilities that are required. So let me go back to, um, uh, to the webinar here. Now let's talk about the migrations. Why do people migrate? Well, the key reason is economic reasons. It's too expensive. It's not flexible enough. Uh, Oracle doesn't let me do what I want to do. I've been threatened by an audit. I want to save money. Okay, those are the reasons why people come to Postgres, but they stay with Postgres because it's really the most innovative relational database out there. I'm biased, I agree, but I challenge you to find another relational database out there that has the capabilities of JSONB, key value pair, PostGIS, interval data types, very advanced data types, for other purposes, et cetera, that really make development of new applications so much easier and so much faster. If you haven't looked into what Postgres can do, take some time, look into just the data types in Postgres. It's at the heart of the capabilities. When you look at JSONB, um, it is so easy to work with it. It is so easy to work with a um, 
document database in Postgres, it is absolutely amazing that people go to other solutions. Once you've experienced PostGIS, I don't think you'll ever go back to spatial. Once you've looked at other data types, let's say just the IPv4, IPv6 data types, you'll see how rich they are and how much coding they save you and how much faster you can get to market. So let me go back to the economic reasons. And if you're interested in this IDC study, uh, we'll send you the, the details, just uh, follow up with us after the webinar. Um, but IDC has done um, an extensive survey two years ago, and the ROI is stunning. The costs are much, much lower, and um, we need less DBA staff time, um, and, and the support costs were lower, et cetera. So it was just, from a cost, purely cost perspective, the much, much better solution. But what's cooler about it, and I'm an engineer, so is, is that it's really the most innovative database out there. It's got a vibrant open source community, and I encourage you to attend one of the conferences or meetups, and you'll see how fast Postgres is moving. It's completely asset compliant, and it's asset compliant for all these things. So it's the same transaction for SQL, JSONB, key value pair, GIS, et cetera. They're not bolt-ons. They're not add-ons. They're not things that you need to manage separately. They're not like some other relational databases or open source relational databases that say, oh, yeah, you know, we can do transactions and analytics. All you need to do is copy the data from one to the other. No, no. Here it's all in the same transactional context. Lots of data types, things like foreign data wrappers, native built-in uh, streaming and logical replication. It is really the most innovative open source relational database that you can find out there. And then compatibility. So EDB has shipped EDB Advanced Server now for um, 12 years. And what we've worked on for 12 years is multiple iterations of something that makes the migration so much easier. You go to other solutions, RDS, for example, or Postgres on Azure, um, and yeah, migrating the schema and the data, actually pretty easy but it's only part of the way. It's actually the easy part, okay? Then people think about, okay, the store procedures. Ah, yeah, that's a lot of work. And you look at things like, I don't know, Aura to PG and other attempts to, to sort of help with that, but it's hard. And that's why we have native compatibility built into, uh, into Postgres Advanced Server. And then you come to the hardest part, which is the drivers because your application will expect that it can talk to the database in certain ways, that the database understands ref cursors, the data, the, 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 the store procedures, et cetera. So if you don't have those capabilities uh, built in, if you don't have drivers that are Oracle compatible, well, your application will need to change big time. So migration becomes like nearly impossible if you can't do all of these four things the schema, the data, the code, and the interface. And those are all the building blocks that you need for a successful migration. So how are we making this easy? Well, EDB Advanced Server, I talked about it, Oracle Compatible Postgres, and I'll come back to it with a little bit more detail. The Cloud Database Service, you can just set it up, and as I showed you before, within minutes, um, you have a completely resilient, cluster with point-in-time recovery and everything set up in the, in the cloud, and it's Oracle compatible. Then you have the migration tools. I'll show you the migration portal, which is uh, the cloud-based migration for schemas and store procedures. I'll show you the, the migration toolkit, which is what we use to push the data. And then we have something called replication server, we won't demo that today, that is really a change data capture tool, which is important for very large databases. Because very large databases, if you push a terabyte to the cloud, it will just take a long time, and it may take too long. You may not have the necessary outage window, and that's why um, a change data capture tool is so important. Then you need the application drivers, OCL for the OCI compatibility, um, ECBG Plus for the ProC compatibility, 
JDBC, ODBC, .NET um, are, are things that are, are very popular and often used. And then management tools. Again, I won't talk about those today, but Enterprise Manager, Failover Manager are required to uh, manage databases on premises at scale. So let me dive a little bit into database compatibility and why, why you need to understand why EDB has invested so much into that. And when you think about what Oracle has done, they've done, they've created significant extensions to the SQL standard, such as decode, NVL, substring, um, date time functions, etc. cetera. Um, they've also obviously created the PLS, PLSQL. So we're supporting that natively with ref, ref cursors, loops, collections, now Pragma Autonomous Transaction, a bunch of tools like, like SQL Plus and SQL Loader. Um, data dictionary views, weight, ev uh, weight events, um, and then um, uh, packages, et cetera, okay? So those are all the capabilities that we have in EDB Advanced Server, and just recently released in the last quarter is uh, support for Pragma Autonomous Transaction and DBMS Redact. So you can now do the same type of data redaction that you may need for PCI compliance and that you know from Oracle, you can do exactly the same thing um, in uh, Postgres Advanced Server, okay? So there's a whole lot of capabilities inside EDB Postgres Advanced Server that make the migration significantly easier, okay? The database drivers, I'm not gonna go through every single one of these check marks, but this will give you an understanding for why an Oracle migration is so much easier if you can use the EDB Postgres database drivers because they will provide PLSQL support, they will provide ref cursor support, in-out parameters, et cetera, things that your application will rely upon, okay? So that, that's why these building blocks are so important for the migration, okay? Now, not every database is a good candidate for migration. And I want to walk you through a step-by-step -step process for identifying the right candidate to get started with. So this is a two-step process. You look at the database with the application from the outside, you identify good candidates, and then you use the migration portal to verify that your assumptions were right and that the, uh, the DDL and the stored procedures can indeed be run on, on Postgres. So, if you have an application that uses Hibernate or Spring, right, um, that's a really, really good candidate. It can have procedures and functions and packages, but they should be written in PLSQL, not in Java. Um, Java is supported in Postgres, but the Java that is used in Oracle to write store procedures uses Oracle proprietary Java packages. Okay, so migrating those is gonna be hard. Um, if the application developers are available, that's really good because functional verification is a lot easier if the original development team is available to help. Um, you wanna stay away from applications that require the use of flashback for operational support or that must have rack for scalability. Not all the apps that use on a, that use a, uh, a two-socket server, and that's why they need it rack for, for scalability, but new apps that have like really large performance requirements because there's no, no easy equivalent to rack in, uh, in Postgres. More difficult are things that use the OCI interface um, or use spatial. PostGIS, I think, is better than spatial, but there's not a one-on-one -on -one translation for spatial into PostGIS, so it requires some manual work. There are some proprietary extensions of Oracle uh, uh, that Oracle provided for the .NET and ODBC drivers that we don't support yet. So um, when you see those drivers, better check the documentation. If somebody uses the ProC interface, typically that's a very old app. It also means that the development team usually is no longer available, so migration just becomes, uh, becomes a lot harder. Store procedures written in Java, I mentioned that before, that's usually a sign for a harder migration. Um, and then the use of other Oracle uh, proprietary extensions. So again, 
when you look at your application inventory, look for things that use Spring or Hibernate, connect with JDBC, um, have store procedures that, that are written in PLSQL, and that will give you a pretty good cookie cutter recipe to identify what in our experience is usually 50 to 60% of all the apps, and they can be migrated really, really quickly. That's also what Tech Validate confirmed when they did a survey of our customers, where the customers basically came back and said, 50% of migrations are easy. Easy in this context means like it's a week or two worth of work and you're done. And a week or two worth of work, most of that time is spent on migrating the data because that can take a while if it's like, you know, a couple of terabytes of data and doing the functional performance verification. You may need to tune a couple of indexes, et cetera. 30% involve more work. So typically our estimate is more than just a couple of weeks. It's like four to six weeks worth of work. And then 20% are difficult. The trick is find the 50%. Find the 50%, use those, cut your teeth on those, uh, get experience, um, convince management that this can be done, that this is a great way to free up money and get you greater license flexibility, allow you to use new features such as JSONB and PostGIS, and then move on to the more difficult ones. Don't start with the application that gives you most grief because usually those are old applications. The development team has long since left. They've been handed off multiple times. Nobody really knows what they do. They just work. Uh, stay away from those. Start with those where, um, that meet the criteria that I outlined a couple slides ago. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you the EDB migration portal. In fact, I'm gonna take you through a whole migration. Okay, so the very first thing I'm gonna do um, is um, I'm gonna show you the database schema here. So what I used for the, what I'm gonna use for this migration is, uh, I'm using the Oracle HR sample. It's a simple sample, but we only have a few minutes time here to go through a complete migration. The HR sample has a number of tables in it. It also has a number of store, it has two store procedures in it. And I'll show you how those store procedures get migrated, including the data. Because our migration engine is so good today that simple examples like this will just migrate with a click of a button, actually add it manually a couple of errors. So I've added a couple of things where our migration portal will have a hiccup so I can show you how to deal with, um, with the situation of hiccup. What I did here is added a table called error example. It has two columns in it. One is called numeric data, and um, that has a data type called binary double. Binary double in standard Postgres is not supported. Um, the equivalent is double precision. I'll show you here how the migration portal actually handles that automatically. Then I've added another column called partition, okay? And it's just a VAR chart. That's not a big deal. Um, it also illustrates that in, po in uh, Oracle, I can say the VAR chart, the width of the VAR, VAR chart is 12 bytes. In Postgres, it always defaults to byte. So the keyword byte would actually cause a problem the EDB migration portal will automatically remove that, but it will stumble on partition because partition is a reserved word in Postgres, um, in Postgres advanced server, and uh, it can't be a column name. It will have to be quoted. I'll show you exactly how that process works, okay? So the very first thing I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show you the EDB migration portal. Okay, so I'm gonna go to, um, uh, Enterprise DB. Oops, excuse me. Yeah. Okay, and I'm going to go in there to the uh, the migration portal because I'm already logged in. It just logs me straight in. I'm going to go. So, and the steps in the migration portal are: is I will extract the definitions from Oracle. I'll create a project in the portal. I'll upload it, I'll run the assessment, I'll export it to, uh, to Oracle. So very first step is I'll create a project and I'll call this uh, webinar January, webinar January, right? Okay, and this is a webinar demo. And this is gonna be a migration from 12C to 
Enterprise DD 10. Okay, I'm going to create my project. I'm going to go in here and I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to run an assessment. Well, in order for to run my assessment, I would have to create to to extract my DDL. In order to extract the DDL, I would run a DDL extractor. Okay, the DDL extractor, you just download it uh, from our portal here. I've already done that. So I'm going to show you how to run the DDL extractor against Oracle. You remember, I had my Oracle database here. Um, excuse me, that's the wrong command window. Um, and I downloaded this. I had, I had logged into my Oracle database. And I'm going to run my um, uh, my DDL extractor. Okay. I'm going to extract the HR schema, uh, put it into a default location, and it's just extracting all the definitions from my HR sample with the um, with the additional um, uh, error table that I created. So I'll put that into um, into into a file. And that file will be a standard SQL script. We'll take a quick look at that script as soon as the extractor is done here. Obviously, my database was asleep, so um, it'll take a while for the server to, uh, uh, to, to, to run the script. Okay, it's almost done here. It extracts 13 different types of constructs, including the, the store procedures, the views, the tables, etc. Okay, all right, so it's now created my, my file here, and I'm gonna go take a look at this file. Um, okay, so this is the file that was just created now. Let's open this up, take a, view, take a look at it. I'll open this up with uh, Notepad. Okay, so the reason we are doing this as a clear text file is that, so that you as a, as, a, as a DBA can take a look at it and make sure that we're not you know, extracting any untoward information from your database that we would then upload. So it's a pretty standard um, uh, DDL file here with the create tables, et cetera, including my, um, my error example, okay? So what I'm now doing is I'm gonna go back to my EDB migration portal. I'm uploading this DDL that we just, that we just created, okay? I'm gonna run a quick assessment. You can see the assessment is blindingly fast, and he comes back saying, well, you know, 97.3% compatibility on the first go. I have an error here in the table. I have one table that failed. So let me go into my list of tables here, and obviously my error example is the one that failed. Let's go into there, into that table. In this error example, we see two things that happened. First, we had an error handler fire and it did what I talked about before. It replaced binary double, which is not supported in Postgres Advanced Server, with the term double precision, which is the equivalent for the, uh, for the Oracle data type binary double, okay? So the error handler um, took care of that. Um, if you wanna know what are the other repair handlers that we support, there's a whole list of those repair handlers uh, that we can take a look at here and they fire automatically when they find when they find uh, uh, when they find the right uh, the right error here. Let me just uh, see if uh, if there's one that I like like here. It replaces n clob with clob because that's the equivalent uh, the equivalent in in Postgres. So let me go back to the migration portal here. So it fixed this one error, but it still has another one here with partition. As I said before, partition is a keyword and I need to replace it with a quoted version of partition. I'm just gonna do that, but first I'm gonna show you here, we have a whole knowledge base where um, I can just type in and say, hey, you know, I'm getting this error here and I can go back to, uh, you know, my, my reserved words list and uh, it's only gonna show me that I need to replace partition with a quoted version of partition in order to make it work. So I'll quickly do that in here. Okay, I'm gonna just quote partition. I'm gonna run my assessment again. And now I have 100% uh, success. I'm gonna export my DDL, just gonna export this schema here. And I'm gonna put it, um, 
into a file called Webinar Jam. Save that. At the same time, I already fired up PG Admin 4. I connected to one of my uh, databases that I had um, in, in the cloud, Demo 1. You may remember that one from before. And what I'm going to do now in here is I'm going to just go open up a query tool. I'm going to load in my file that I just generated. Right one. Okay. Gonna execute that and you'll see here. Oops. Oops, I made a mistake. Uh, sorry. Wrong file. Uh, Example. Uh, okay, so now I created a new schema in here, and I have a schema called HR, and now I have all my tables and everything is uh, is in here. So all my tables that I looked at before uh, have been have been defined here. I can look at my error example. Um, I can uh, look at that, and you can see that um, that you know my data types are all there. Double precision now instead of uh, instead of the Oracle instead of the Oracle data type. The last step I'm now going to do is um, I'm actually going to migrate the data. For that, I'm going to run the migration toolkit, and that's going to be a very fast migration of all that data uh, from my Oracle database. into my Postgres database in the cloud. So in here, I can now say, hey, let me, let me look at my job history table. Uh, my job history table now has all my data in it, okay? And I can now also run a stored procedure to uh, add more data in here. So I'm just gonna, um, uh, I'm going to run a, uh, a simple sort of procedure here to just add um, add data to that table here, and now we can go back to my um, to this table here that used to have ten rows, and now you'll see that it has eleven rows in it. Okay, so what I've shown you now is we were able to extract the definitions from Oracle apply them to EDB Postgres in the cloud, migrate the data, and run a stored procedure. All of that in a few minutes, okay? So if I now go back um, to, uh, to the webinar here, you can see that, you know, migrating to EDB Cloud Database Service is very, very easy. In the short time that we were sitting here, we were able to create a database cluster I was able to show you the scale up, scale down, how all of those operations work. The EDB migration portal makes the migration of schemas, stored procedures, et cetera, very, very easy. Tools like the EDB migration toolkit can pump that data across in minutes. Given this was a very simple, very small database, a larger database will take longer, but again, um, there's, no reason, there's no reason not to do this. So what I encourage you to do is immediately after this webinar, fire up EDB Cloud Database Service, use the uh, uh, the migration uh, the migration portal, and do a similar migration. Take the Oracle HR sample and just push it across. Convince yourself that in the this is pretty straightforward. Then use the guidelines I've given you meaning the focus on databases, on applications that connect via JDBC, potentially those using uh, uh, Hibernate or Spring or any other uh, ORB, okay? Um, don't be afraid of stored procedures. They migrate actually quite easily. Just make sure that you have stored procedures that are written in PLSQL. Um, 
and um, give this a try. There's really absolutely no reason not to do that. I'd encourage you to take advantage of the, uh, the $50 free trial. Um, and if you're serious about it, uh, send us an email and we'll sign you up for the Premier Beta. That means that one of my colleagues will want to talk to you to hear some feedback. That's sort of part of the deal, but that's all we need from you. Um, just want to make sure that, uh, that what we're providing makes sense, is easy to use, um, and helpful. Okay? So, next steps, sign up for free training. EDB provides really, really good free training. Complement that free training with certifications. Um, and then try the EDB migration portal. Sign up for the EDB Cloud Database Service. Uh, get in touch with us. And if you want to be on that um, uh, premier beta, it's cds-help at enterprisedb.com. Okay, now we're open for uh, questions. All right, thank you very much, Mark. We do have a few questions for you today before we conclude today's session. Uh, let's start with a few for CDS. Can you make these changes in a live cluster? The question was asked during your demo. Yeah, you can, you can, you can add to um, a live cluster, yes. Uh, obviously, if you want to upsize the, the machines, they will be st uh, uh, stopped and restarted, right? You can't go from a, I don't know, an M4 extra large to an M5 extra large without um, a stop and restart, but you can add, you can add replicas, yes. Thank you. Um, and when do you plan to go live with the service? Um, two to three weeks should be the GA. Great. Uh, when will CDS be in other AWS regions? Um, is there an option of having hosting on data center within Canada? Uh, please get in touch with us. Absolutely, we will consider that. We're always customer driven. Uh, we are going to expand to other regions in the first quarter of this year. Um, so, and again, uh, let us know which region is of interest, and we'll, uh, we'll consider expanding into that region. Great. Um, is this the same Oracle compatibility that I would get on-premises, or is something missing? It's exactly the same Oracle compatibility. In fact, it's exactly the same Postgres. And if, you, if you're really into Postgres, right, and if you've used other Postgres in the cloud, let's say RDS or, or um, uh, Azure Postgres, you will see that not all configuration capabilities are there, right? It's somewhat a, let's say, constrained Postgres. We've taken a different tack. We give you all capabilities of standard Postgres. So not only is this the same Oracle compatibility that you would get on-premises, or if you ran uh, EDB Postgres in EC2, no, it's also a Postgres that gives you a lot more capabilities as the DBA, to uh, decide about tuning, about parameters, uh, et cetera. Thank you. Is there a cloud service for Google Cloud as well? Not yet. Again, uh, get in touch with us. Uh, help us understand uh, you know, the, the drivers for this. Um, uh, Google, uh, the next one on our list right now is Azure. Uh, Google is a little bit further down the road. But again, we're customer driven. Am I really the administrator for my databases on CDS? Yes, yes, you are, with all responsibilities, all capabilities and all responsibilities. Obviously, our support team is here to help um, if there are questions. And um, if you have questions, please call us early and call us often. Um, please don't call us after you made the mistake. Um, call us if you're not 100% sure. So. Yes, you are truly the administrator, and you're truly responsible for your database. Thank you. I'll move over to a few migration portal questions. Is there any difference between whether you difference whether you migrate to on-premises or to Postgres on Amazon or Azure? Um, not as long as you're staying within the EDB Postgres service. Right. If there, there's a big difference, if you go to RDS Postgres, because RDS Postgres is not Oracle, Oracle compatible, RDS Postgres does not have the Oracle compatible drivers, it does not understand packages, it does not have a native PLSQL capability. So um, basically, you'll have to you'll have to translate all the data types manually. You'll have to do all the syntactical transformations. Um, you'll have to rewrite the stored procedures, etc. So um, 
as long as you stay within EDB Postgres, um, you will have all the same capabilities. Thank you. And if I get stuck with a migration, how do I get help? Um, there is a uh, so through Postgres Rocks. So first, if you're if you're a current customer, um, just log a support ticket. Um, if you are just a uh, migration portal user, uh, please contact us through Postgres Rocks, which is our support forum where we answer questions and uh, and and help users. And uh, in case of any questions, I mean, you know, info at enterprisedb.com is always a good uh, a good way to start. Thank you. Are there any downloadable migration assessment tools versus using web? Uh, yes, there is the migration toolkit, which uh, you can download. Um, obviously, if you're a customer, you have full access to it. If you're not a customer, you can do a 60-day trial. Um, just go to uh, uh, www.enterprisedb.com, go to the downloads page, and look for the migration toolkit. That you can run on-premises, you can run it on Windows, which is what I just showed, um, or on, uh, on Linux. Thank you. Is there a limit to the size of the database that you can migrate? Can databases be too large? Um, well, um, they can be too large for they can be too large for Postgres. I mean, today, the largest referenceable customer database that we have is 50 terabytes. So that's a very very large database for any kind of relational system. Um, the the challenge when you want to do a migration is usually not the overall size of the database because you know even in the Oracle world, 50 terabyte databases are few and far between. The challenge is more the downtime and the time that you have to do the migration, and that is where um, a change data capture tool such as EDB Replication Server comes in handy because that will allow you to do a snapshot migration, and the snapshot migration may take a long time. Let's say for you know, four or five terabytes, it can take a couple of days. And then you would use the change data capture to catch up to the changes that have happened in the last four to five days and then do the actual cutover so that your actual downtime that the application suffers is very, very small. Okay, so usually it's not the overall size of the database, it's the time that it requires to migrate the data. Thank you. How do I securely transfer data from on-prem to EDB via the migration tool? Does the migration tool require direct access to the on-prem database? It doesn't. So, so in the migration portal, there's, it's a two-step process, and we did that intentionally. We run the extractor, okay? So we didn't look into the details of the extractor, but download the extractor. The extractor is a PLSQL script. It's delivered in clear text. The reason we delivered in clear text is so that the DBA can convince him or herself before running it that there's nothing nefarious happening. The extractor needs read-only access to the catalogs. That's all it needs, okay? So it won't do anything bad. The result of the extractor, again, is a text file so that the DBA can inspect it before uploading it to the migration, uh, the migration portal. The... Um, um, the data privacy terms and conditions around the the, uh, the migration portal are very clear. They're spelled out as part of the uh, um, the overall terms and conditions, and we will protect your data. We will not publish your data. Thank you. How do I know before a migration? What are some of the things I could look out for that would be difficult? Well, on the one side, uh, the 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 characteristics of the application. So you know, generally, if an application uses JDBC. Um, they tend to be more well behaved. Um, if um, uh, if it uses uh, you know the the the, the PLSQL, PLSQL to write the store procedures, um, uh, that's usually a pretty good uh, a pretty good indicator that the migration will be fairly straightforward. So there's a number of those things that you can look at from the outside. Then you would look you then you would run the migration portal, and in the migration portal you can also run parallel analysis for a larger number of schemas all at the same time. So if your same database server runs, I don't know, 20, 20 schemas, you can extract them all and upload them all, all in the same fell swoop. Okay. So um, 
I would narrow down the focus initially using the guidelines that I gave in the webinar, um, and then then do an analysis of 20, 30, 40 different schemas to find out which are the things that uh, um, that are that are going to be easy to migrate. Once the migration portal says, "Yep, this this is a go," um, there's very little probability that you'll run into serious problems. Thank you. Just one or two more. Can I migrate mar partition tables? Yes, you can. Um, and what other relational database management systems are supported using the migration toolkit? The migration toolkit supports also uh, SQL Server and and uh, MySQL, SQL Server and Sybase, excuse me. Um, but it does not uh, migrate the uh, the T-SQL functions. So uh, there's no we don't we don't offer out of the box compatibility for uh, for T-SQL today, but it will do a very good job at migrating the, uh, the data definitions uh, and the data itself. Thank you very much, Mark. I apologize for those questions that we were unable to get to today, but that is all of the time we have. Thank you all for joining us for the webinar. We'll be sharing this recording along with the slides with you as soon as possible. And thank you very much, Mark, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day.